A 55-year-old woman came to a doctor with complaints of thyroid enlargement that could be observed throughout the last two years. So a gradual enlargement of the thyroid gland, I'm thinking a goiter, and a discomfort during swallowing. So the pressure effect of the goiter, right? Objectively, she has signs of hypothyroidism. Yes, you know the signs of hypothyroidism, bradycardia, weight gain, cold intolerance, so on and so forth. The thyroid gland on palpation is dense, not fused with the surrounding tissues, mobile during swallowing. The regional lymph nodes are not enlarged. Lab tests detect anti-thyroid antibodies in the blood serum. What is the most likely diagnosis? So, of course, you see hypothyroidism and you see anti-thyroid antibodies from previous lectures. This will be Hashimoto thyroiditis. What antibodies are they talking about? Thyroglobulin antibodies, um, thyroid peroxidase antibodies, right? This will not be thyroid cancer. In thyroid cancer, there's nothing in the question linking us to thyroid cancer, maybe a code nodule or family history of thyroid cancer or maybe weight loss, which can also be seen in hyperthyroidism, right? Or maybe, maybe when they did a biopsy, they saw some atypical presentation. They didn't talk about that here. Also, thyroid cancer, depending on the severity, can infiltrate nearby organs and because it has infiltrated nearby organs it can be fused which they didn't talk about in the question acute thyroiditis were done so many times um is bacterial infection of the thyroid gland the thyroid gland should be painful on palpation and again they're not talking about a bacteria yes they're talking about antithyroid antibodies endemic goiter we see this in a region where they lack iodine in their soil so this is endemic thyroglossal cysts or midline cervical cysts normally they do not alter the this is meant to be altered they do not alter the thyroid hormone function so they don't cause either hypo or hyperthyroidism on palpation it will be a painless smooth non-tender lump and it's well defined it moves um when the patient protrudes their tongue and we must see this in the pediatric population the thyroglossal seat can be painful but this is only when there's infection and this is very very rare you can see a photo of your thyroglossal cysts when they protrude their tongue also when you're talking about um, thyroid mass how to differentiate normally your thyroid normally your goiter and your thyroglossal cyst they move with swallowing however just for the thyroglossal cyst they would move with tongue protrusion your goiter and the other masses would not move with tongue protrusion so let's have a brief summary again of the different thyroid pathologies when we're talking about Graves disease so hyperthyroidism we have the normal hyperthyroidism sign like um tremors weight loss because of this increased metabolic demand there's this increased appetite um but there will be weight loss, yes, sensitivity to heat. There can be menstrual changes in the women. Most specifically in grave disease, we see the exothermus. You can also see the eye signs, which I talked about in previous video. For um, grave disease, we see pretibia, mixed edema. In contrast, when we're talking about hypothyroidism, like in mixed edema, where we see the um, edema, the mixed edema in the face and the hands. So in grave disease, you're going to have high level of T3, T4. However, you're going to have low level of TSH. There's also an antibody present in grave disease, but this will be TSI, thyroid stimulating antibodies. We've talked about this in so many, we have talked about this in previous lectures. The best initial treatment due to this, like hyperthyroidism, is going to provide acutely relief is propanolol. However, for the treatment of grave disease itself, because it's a chronic disease, you need to give antithyroid drugs like metimazole or PTU. Yes, we know that for a pregnant woman, metimazole is contraindicated in the first trimester, yes, because it is heterogenic. So we, we give PTU in the first trimester. However, PTU has its own side effects that we've talked about here. So that's why once the woman is not in the first trimester, you can change back to a um, metimazole. When we talk about the toxic nodular goiter, so goiter, this is an enlargement of the um, thyroid gland. It says, I'm going to show you a, video, a picture soon. Nodular, so you have nodule. So if they say toxic nodular, so just one nodule, this is also known as toxic adenoma. But when you have multiple nodules, this is... This is toxic multinodular goiter because you still have the enlargement of the thyroid gland itself. Toxic, so there's hyperthyroidism. Non-toxic, you don't have this hyperthyroidism. As you can see when you do the radioactive iodine um, optic scan, you see the engraved disease, you have goiter, right? You can see the normal thyroid gland. In grave disease, you have goiter, so you can see that this thyroid gland is enlarged. However, this is hyperthyroidism, so you can see hyperfunction. In thyroiditis, as you can see here, the thyroid gland is enlarged. Yes, because I told you, it doesn't matter whether hypo, hyper or hypo, the thyroid gland can be enlarged in both of them. That's goiter. But because it's not hyperfunctioning, you see that it's not that, um, you can see it's not that dark. You can see your toxic modular goiter. So you can see there's a goiter because the thyroid gland is enlarged, but you have what multiple nodules. 
in toxic adenoma, you see the um, thyroid gland is enlarged, but you just have what one new gene. We're talking about the code new gene, so you can see what it looks like. This is in case of a malignancy. What do you do next? Find needle aspiration biopsy. When we talk about the thyroiditis, this is inflammation of the thyroid gland. There are so many types of thyroiditis. Without thyroiditis, this is this inflammation is causing this um, severe fibrosis. So you have a rock hard thyroid gland. After semolina was introduced into the diet, so semolina is a gluten containing food. They went on to say that the child was presenting with loss of appetite, irritability, loss of body mass, so um, weight loss, and what cupus and foul smell is too. So now we have this diarrhea. You, you know why it is because I've talked about it so many times. They went on to say that the skin is pale and dry, the hair is brittle, the abdomen is distended, the limbs are thin, stool test shows high level of fatty acid has come out to this point. What is the most likely diagnosis? So this is um, celiac disease due to. This is an autoimmune disease where gluten containing food causes an immune response. This immune response damages the intestinal villi. Your intestinal villi is supposed to absorb your nutrient. So if you have damaged this, you cannot absorb your nutrient. So you're going to have malabsorption. Yes. Yeah, so that's why he's having the diarrhea. What are you going to see on biopsy? T cell infiltration of the mucosa, hyperplasia or enlargement of the crypts and villi atrophy. However, biopsy is very invasive. Yes, you can do serology, like you can check for the presence of antibodies like anti-TTG, anti-endomasia, anti gliadin This is a brief summary of the gluten-containing food and food that does not contain gluten. And if you notice here, they said that this too shows high level of fatty acid. I think that's quite important because normally if you have like pancreatic insufficiency where you are not able to um, break down your fats, you're going to see fat in this stool. But because they are saying fatty acid, they are probably saying that this fat has been broken down. We are showing you that your pancreas is normal. You are able to digest this um, food. Yes, because you have broken down this large fat to the um like the tiny micromolecules to so the fatty acid. However, you cannot you cannot absorb this. So that's why they said high level of fatty acid. Yes, irritable bowel syndrome. So there's no structural changes in the bowels. You get recurrent abdominal pain on average at least one day per week in the last three months associated with some of the following. So this is more related to like your bowel movements, like defecation, change in the frequency of stool change in the appearance of stool. In contrast, when we're talking about functional dyspepsia, so dyspepsia means like an upset stomach, something like that. So this is more of, so you need one of the following, and no evidence of structural changes. So you need either postprandial fullness, early 38, epigastric pain and epigastric bone. You see that this is more of your, like epigastrum, your fullness. In contrast to the irritable bowel syndrome, there's more of the bowel movement. Functional diarrhea basically just means diarrhea without a cause, which they're not talking about in this question. Um, lactate deficiency um, is also known as lactose intolerance um, due to um, the fact that they cannot break down lactose. A 19-year-old pregnant woman was hospitalized into the Department of Pregnancy Pathology. Her term of gestation is 36 weeks. The fetus is large with breech presentation. The woman has a severe form of diabetes. So it's because of the diabetes, that is why the fetus is large. Yes, we've talked about this so many times. The fetal heart rate is 90 beats per minute, so they even told you bradycardia, and no labor activity can be de detected. So the fetus is large, breech presentation. Now you see signs of fetal distress. What do you do? Of course, this is what urgent cesarean section. This child is too big to pass through the normal vaginal canal because the woman has diabetes, and that led to the big baby. The child is in breech presentation again, which makes it harder for the um, child to pass through the birth canal. Obviously, this will be cesarean section. A five-year-old child became acutely ill with fever of 39.2 degrees Celsius, so very high fever. One episode of vomiting and complaints of crampy pain in the abdomen, tenesmus, which is false fecal urgency, and movements that produce a what sequent bowel feces and a large amount of mucus and pulse and blood streaks. So you see bloody diarrhea. The examination detected a dense sigmoid colon. Obviously, this is what shigellosis, shigella infection. We've talked about it so many times. They try to confuse it by seeing a large amount of mucus and pulse. Yes, in Shigella, you have a small amount of feces with a, with, which is mixed with mucus and pulse. Salmonellosis, not typhoid fever. Yes, they are two different things. We've talked about this before. Salmonellosis, this is more of food poisoning, um, fecal oral root. The key thing, if they talk about um, exposure to egg or maybe a birthday party, yes, where they came in contact with egg containing products. This causes um, gastroenteritis, so inflammation of the intestine, most specifically the small intestine. So you can see pain around the umbilicus. This um, samolina mostly affects the um, intestine, especially the pears patches. Why? Because here, the cells here, they do not have basement membranes. So it's easier for the samolina to 
um, invade the cells. So you can have fever, which can either be subfebrile or febrile. There could be um, headache, abdominal pain, especially in the umbilicus, constipation or diarrhea, and this diarrhea can have a greenish color. So let's talk about cholera because we have not talked about cholera. So cholera is caused by the bacteria vivo chlorella, fecal oral route of transmission. So this again multiplies in the small intestine. The pathogenesis is different. This produces a toxin and this toxin would lead to the stimulation of this channel, the CFTR channel, and that leads to a lot of chloride ion entering into the intestinal lumen. Wherever chloride goes, sodium follows and water follows sodium. So you're going to have a lot of what, watery diarrhea. This is the hallmark of cholera, yes? Watery diarrhea. So how does it present? Watery, non-bloody diarrhea. They can be vomiting due to this um, gastroenteritis. The diarrhea can have a fishy smell and slightly whitish. That's why they call it the rice water stool. Fever, again, is very rare in cholera, but anything is possible in medicine. Because of this severe diarrhea, they can be um, hyponatremia, hypokalemia. Um, this severe dehydration can lead to renal failure. And you can also have signs of rehydration. The treatment, the main thing is rehydration. After that, you can prescribe antibiotics. Toxicycline is a drug of choice. 100 milligrams two times a day. Rotavirus can also cause diarrhea, but I don't really know what is so specific to distinguish rotavirus infection. A 45-year-old patient was referred to a consultation with a psychiatrist due to complaints of abdominal pain and discomfort that occurs in emotionally straining situation. Objectively, no changes of the GI tract were detected. The complaints first arose 10 years ago on the background of a severe alcoholic poisoning. The patient has, re has been repeatedly visiting gastroenterologists who were unable to find any pathology. The prescribed therapy is ineffective. What condition is this? So um, based on the presentation, he does not have any gastrointestinal pathology. This is somatoform autonomic dysfunction, which is when a patient presents with um, physiological symptoms that cannot be explained by any medical condition, meaning like patient does not have any pathology. Organic brain disorder, organic already means there's a pathology, so cannot be A. The patient is not depressed. This is not chronic alcoholism, yes. The patient just had a case of alcohol poisoning 10 years ago. Yes, I'm not talking about chronic alcoholism. Functional dyspepsia, which I just explained to you again, is more of the epigastric um, set pain, early satiety, more of dyspepsia than the abdominal pain. A 34-year-old woman came to a doctor with complaints of muscle weakness, thirst, increased urination at night. I have to come back to those points. They went on to say that her condition is satisfactory. Her face and leg are doughy. Her pulse is 80. Blood pressure is elevated. The heart sounds is increased, so on and so forth. The complete blood count shows that your potassium is 3.1, so hypokalemia, and your sodium level is high, hypernatremia. ECG shows um, inversion of the two is an ST segment depression. That's come out to that point. Ultrasound detects hyperplasia of the right adrenal gland. With the diagnosis, this will be what Cohn's disease, primary hyperaldosteronism, aldosterone, which is a mineral corticoid. The normal function is to what? reabsorb sodium and excrete potassium. So when you have excess, excess reabsorption of sodium, hypernatremia, excess excretion of potassium, hypokalemia. Due to this um, hypernatremia, a lot of sodium, a lot of water, increase in blood pressure. Because there's a lot of sodium in the blood, so hyperosmolarity, increased thirst, that also increased urination, yes, because your body will be trying to remove this um, salt. However, your body is However, in the kidneys, the body is reabsorbing sodium. Why is there muscle weakness due to the hypokalemia? Why are there ECG changes due to the hypokalemia? Last but not least, they told you about the ultrasound showing you hyperplasia in the adrenal gland. So the problems with the adrenal gland is so primary hyperaldosteronism. And essential hypertension is hypertension that doesn't have a cause, which is which has a, a slow onset. Yes, it slowly develops. In this question, there's a cause, which is the um Adrenal hyperplasia, glucosteroma, or also known as corticosteroma or Cushing syndrome. So there's a tumor in the adrenal um, cortex, picking this cortisol, which is the same thing as Cushing syndrome. It's not Cushing disease, that's from the pituitary gland. Pheochromocytoma can cause hypertension, but again, will not affect your potassium and sodium levels. Hypoparathyroidism will cause low level of calcium. A seven-year-old man with history of myocardial infarction developed a brief attack of palpitation accompanied by sensation of lack of air 
fair and vertigo, his blood pressure is low, ECG shows that there's extended QRS complex. So your QRS complex is wide. So you're thinking about a ventricular pathology with a heart rate of 160. This constant sheet of your AC segment and T wave, dissociation of the atrium and ventricular rhythm, they try to confuse you here. What is this? Of course, of course, it's originated from the ventricle, yes, because your QRS complex is wide. It cannot be atrial fibrillation, cannot be supraventricular tachycardia, yes, supra above the ventricles. So you are left with either C to D. It cannot be ventricular extrasystole. This is just ectopic beats, extra beats. It will not really cause that severe presentation like the palpitation, the vertigo. It's just an extra beat. So this will be ventricular tachycardia. Why are we not going for ventricular fibrillation? If they want you to choose ventricular fibrillation, they have to tell you in the question that, well, this is irregular rhythm because in ventricular tachycardia, it is irregular. If you look at this question, you can see that the ECG shows what irregular waves of varying shape and amplitude. So even if they didn't specify here, QRS complex is wide, but we know that out of all this, we know that out of all these pathologies, your ventricular fibrillation will be irregular. Forensic autopsy of the body of a 59-year-old man who died suddenly at home without signs of violent death shows pink, shows pink skin and mucosa, bright red blood and bright red internal organs. So like the cherry um, red skin and organs, yes. Forensic toxicology in the blood detected um, 1.4% level of ethanol. So this is not alcohol poisoning. And the blood cap hemoglobin level is 55%. I don't like the fact that they are highlighting these things. Anyways, what is the cause of the death in this case? First of all, they say he died at home without any sign of struggle. So you know that carbon monoxide is an odorless, tasteless, colorless gas. And most likely he stayed in an enclosed place. They also told you about the cherry um, red appearance and the high level of carboxyhemoglobin, so carbon monoxide poisoning. Now, let's just assume they did not tell you carboxyhemoglobin level was high and they asked you what test should you use. Post oximetry will not be helpful to um, detect carboxyhemoglobin. You don't use oximetry to detect this. In fact, it might even be normal and confuse you. What you have to do will be what arterial blood gas, in which you're going to check for the carboxyhemoglobin level, and it's going to be elevated. The normal level should be less than 5% in a non-smoker, and the patient that smokes, it can be as high as 10%. A 26-year-old woman complains of crampy abdominal pain, diarrhea with significant amount of blood and mucus. So the diarrhea is mixed with blood and mucus. I'm thinking Shigella. I'm thinking maybe I'm thinking Shigella. I'm thinking about some ulcerative process in the... Um, Intestine, yes. The only thing to say that there's fever. Objectively, her skin is pale, so on and so forth. Palpation detects pain in the large intestine. Mm -hmm. Colonoscopy reviews edematous wall of the rectum and sigmoid colon. Erosions and small ulcers with mucus and blood in the lumen. What is the diagnosis? First of all, and what's the difference between ulcer and erosion? Ulcer is deeper. Yes? It's deeper, so the um, basement membrane has been removed. Erosion, the basement membrane is still intact. What is the most likely diagnosis? So this would be ulcerative colitis. Now, why not um dysentery? It presents very similar to dysentery, but um in dysentery there can also be additional signs like um tenesmus, which is this false fecal urgency. And when they go to and when they go to defecate, the feces will be very small amount with blood and mucus, which they did not talk about. So that's why we are leaning more on the ulcerative colitis. Chronic enteritis is a chronic inflammation of the intestine. Here, they're talking about the, what, the um, colon. Crohn's disease mostly affects the ileum, which again, um, they're not talking about the ileum. Yes, they're talking about your um, sigmoid and rectum. This is not cancer of the large intestine. There's a marker for the cancer of your intestine, which is known as, which is the CEA marker. You can check that up yourself. Do not confuse this with microscopic colitis or chronic non ulcerative colitis. In contrast to that one, that one is non specific or serrative colitis, so there's ulcer formation there. That's why there's bleeding. A 14-year-old girl developed morning fever, chilitis, stomatitis, photosensitivity, leukocytosis, is increased thrombocytopenia, lab tests except antinuclear antibody in high tata make the right diagnosis. Cannot be um, juvenile hepatic arthritis because there's nothing in the question about arthritis, about joint pain. They didn't talk about jelly, they didn't talk about stiffness. Dermatomyositis, there should be um, dermatological signs and muscle weakness, which they're not talking about in this question. Systemic so scleroderma, which is an autoimmune attack on your connective tissue, should have like this tight skin, which again, they're not talking about in this question. Now, it's not sepsis because they didn't talk about low blood pressure, increased heart rate, and infection, yes. So this is systemic erythematosis. The key things, photosensitivity, yes, and the antinuclear antibodies. We know that it can be a malar rash or a discoid rash. The malar rash is acute, the discoid rash is chronic. And then 
this rash can be triggered when they're exposed to sun or they're very sensitive to sun exposure. Remember when I showed you the um, criteria for diagnosis is the dermatosis. The criteria is very large, as you can see. So the key thing I just highlight for you, the crop is talking about a autoimmune condition that's affecting a lot of organs. And they talk about some specific antibodies like anti DSDNA antibody, anti Smith antibodies. It's more specific for systemic erythematosis. Or if they don't want to tell you about a lot of organs being affected, yes. But the key thing in that question was the ANA antibody, which can also be seen in other pathology. However, the photosensitivity is also quite unique for systemic lupus erythematosis.